When I first finished my training as a furniture maker, the first thing that I knew that I had to do was to build a bench. And this bench here has served me for 40 years. Over the years, I've built hundreds of pieces on this maple top. Now I'm going to show you how to make it. One of the great things about this workbench is its relative small footprint. I can reach pieces from all different sides. Another really special thing about this bench is the bank of drawers that we have here in the door down below. You can store all your favorite hand tools and what that does is it adds great weight to the bench and it prevents it from moving around when you're doing hand planing. And here we have a great sturdy maple top that really gives a lot of stability to the bench. And the base has sliding dovetails for the dividers and mortise and tenons to hold the legs together. If you're ready to build the last workbench you'll ever need, join me and we'll build the bench that got me started as a furniture maker. We'll start with lessons on proper milling techniques, then we'll move on to joinery as I show you how to cut tight, clean mortise and tenon joints. Then we'll use beautiful, strong sliding dovetail joinery for the base partitions and drawer dividers. Working in stages, we'll glue up the base and use simple plywood panels to enclose the storage space. And since no workbench is complete without a flat, stable, heavy top, I'll show you how to glue up a laminated bench top with over two dozen bench dog holes that will allow you to secure just about any workpiece. We'll follow up with a lesson on classic dovetail drawers and end with a frame and panel door. All the parts on the card here are cut to finish dimensions now. Uh, I consulted my rough stock list to begin with to do a rough milling. Let me take a minute to show you the milling technique that I use. After consulting my cut list, I mark and cut each of the parts to length at the miter saw. Next I mark out and strike lines for any of the rip cuts. I like to rip my stock at the bandsaw before milling. Uh, if you're going to relieve any of the tension of the internal parts of the wood, uh, it's much safer to do it on the bandsaw than it is the table saw. Now I'm going to joint one surface flat. The first thing I need to do is to look at the grain direction and make sure that I'm going with the grain. So we have a saying that the heart points the way. So you can see the annual rings on the end of the board here. So this would be the center of the tree. If we flip it over and we look at the annual rings, they point in this direction. So this would be the direction that we want to plane in. I like to feed the wood into the cutter head at a bit of an angle. This helps to reduce the tear out. It's always a good idea to mark your jointed edges. You don't want to lose track of them. When the parts come off the jointer, I stack them on the cart in a very methodical way so that I can pick the part up and put it into the machine exactly the same way that came off the jointer. Now, I usually set the table of the machine to the thickest dimension first and that way I'm only raising the table once to go through all of the thicknesses that I need when I do in my planing. Okay, now that we have the, uh, the fence square, we want to take the, uh, the piece and put it against the fence and joint one end square. The reason why we plane both surfaces flat uh, and plane it to thickness parallel so that when we put it against the fence, we can make sure that we're going with the grain. Well, now it's time to get these pieces to width. The uh, thinner pieces I'll cut on the table saw, and the thicker pieces I like to send through the planer because I have a nice square edge so that when I run it through on the table, this opposite edge will come out nice and parallel and also square. It also prevents some of the twisting of the boards because when you rip these on the table saw, a little bit of a tension is relieved and it tends to keep the pieces a little flatter. After ripping the board to width, I take the saw marks off at the jointer. Notice I'm using a stop lock to cut the end square. This keeps my stock from drifting along the miter gauge. And don't forget to mark the end square. Now measure and mark your stock. Align the sawtooth to your mark, set your stop, and make your cuts.
Okay, now it's time to do some layout of mortise and tenons. Uh, we have our short rails, our long rails, and our legs. The legs will be mortised, and the rails will have the tenons on them. I've picked up the length of my tenon from the plan. Now I'll just set my marking gauge accordingly. I make a tick mark representing the shoulder line of all my tenons, and then I use a square and a knife to wrap my marks around the four sides of each workpiece. If the end of the piece isn't perfectly square, the marking gauge will just reflect the inaccuracy. One of the things that you're going to notice though, I always keep the head of my square against these two surfaces in order to wrap a line that'll line up. So you'll notice that i am got the head of the square against this surface that has the pencil mark, the pencil mark here. I'll put the head of the square against that pencil line surface and score this. When I come up this way, I'll have the head of the square against the surface that has the pencil line. And then again, when I go over to this surface, the pencil line is on this side. And I'll run that line so that those lines come, come out and line up all the way around. And I'll just go ahead and finish these off with the other ones. I've picked up the uh, length of the short rails from the drawing. And the crucial dimension here is the distance between the shoulders. Now I'm going to pick up the length of the shoulders from this original one that I have already marked out. So I want to make sure that I get the, exactly the same length, and this will help to ensure squareness. And I'll do that on all four of these. Okay, what I need to do now is to go ahead and orient our parts. Uh, what you'll notice is that I have uh, the long rails and the short rails. There's two different sizes. We have a wide rail and a narrow rail. The, the narrow one is the top, the wide one's the bottom. Um, and we need to get those uh, widths onto the legs so that we know where the location of the mortises are going to be. So what I'm going to do first of all is pick up my marking gauge and take uh, the narrowest rail and set my marking gauge to that dimension. And with this score mark, I'll lay it out on the edge of the board. But first of all, I want to orient these legs. And what you're looking for here is just a pleasing, uh, you know, outside surfaces that are going to look well. You know, I got some of this discoloration in the, uh, the material or so, and so forth. So um, I'm going to have these lighter colors facing out. So these will be a pair of legs. I'll open them up like this and my mortises will go on these surfaces. And I'll do the same for this other pair as well. I'm careful to mark from the same reference face on each leg. I'll mark the, uh, the top mortise I line up my rail to the marks indicating the bottom of the mortise I make a tick mark now I strike the line indicating the top of the mortise a quarter inch down from that mark that will leave me a quarter inch shoulder at the top of the tenon I begin by marking my mortise walls, scribing a line for just one of the walls of each mortise. Without resetting the marking gauge, I can strike the first tenon cheek mark on each of the rails. Next, I reset my marking gauge for the width of the mortise and strike the opposing mortise wall line on the legs. I can use the same setting to mark the opposing tenon cheeks on each rail as well. There, now we've got all our parts flat, straight, and square. We've got our joinery done. But the reason why we did this offset uh, tenon here is to accommodate a rabbit for a plywood panel. It'll go in later on when we have the bench assembled. Okay, I guess we're ready to cut some mortises.